Respected panelists, dear participants, welcome to our webinar on the theme, the potential and benefits of trade and business activities with North Korea. My name is Ole Thoresen. I'm the IAED Vice Coordinator for Europe and the Middle East. Before we begin, I would like to refer to some technical details. We have translations into the Russian language. If you need translation, please click on the globe icon at the bottom of your screen, as you see, and choose your language. The chat icon is just for remarks and information. And the bias of the panelists will also be available there. To write your questions, please use the Q&A icon. Throughout this year, UPF Europe and Middle East has been holding a series of international leadership conferences on the theme toward peaceful unification of the Korean Peninsula. This webinar is part of three ILCs being held in June, July and August 2021. This August conference focuses on prospects for economic development and peace on the peninsula. As you may know, UPF is an NGO with general consultative status at the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. Its main goal is to promote peace and prosperity in the world based on the vision that humankind is one global family. To achieve this goal, UPS has created several associations that work in various fields. This present webinar is organized by the International Association for, for Peace and Economic Development, IAED, which as its name indicates, aims to contribute to peace through harmonious economic development. Then let me introduce the moderator of this webinar, Mrs. Marcia de Abreu, is the Secretary General of Women's Federation for World Peace Europe. In this position, and as leader of Women's Federation for World Peace Spain for over 20 years, she has helped organizing conferences in several European countries, as well as uh, in Brussels at the European Parliament, and also had various uh, webinars in Europe. Now, it's my pleasure to hand over to you, Mrs. Marcia de Abreu, please. Thank you, Mr. Torresen. Good, good afternoon, everyone, distinguished panelists and participants. It's my pleasure to be the moderator for this session today. In this session, you will be hearing about the potential and benefits of trade and business activities with North Korea. Foreign trade and business activities have always been tools for communication between the peoples helping to maintain peace and provide benefits for the parties involved. Technology has increased these benefits by providing greater efficiency in the economy. With North Korea's nuclear rise seen as a threat by neighboring nations, the UN sanctions are currently blocking the country's trading capacity. At the recent 8th Communist Party Congress, North Korea's leadership announced a new focus on economic development. China, Vietnam, and other socialist countries engage actively in world trade. I would like to ask our distinguished panelists to consider the following questions in your presentations. Does North Korea have the potential to become an attractive destination for tourism, for example, from China, Russia, Japan, and South Korea? Is it possible to overcome the climate of distrust between North Korea and its democratic and capitalist neighbors? 
Could you suggest some concrete steps to start dissolving this distrust? Which North Korean products and services can attract international interests? What are the obstacles to international business with North Korea besides distrust? Can the resolutions of the January 2021 North Korean Party Congress boost business activities? Our speakers will offer their perspectives on what steps should be taken both by North Korea and the rest of the world to obtain the mutual benefits that international trade potentially offers. With this preamble to the discussions, I would like to introduce our first speaker now. Dr. Pavel Leshakov graduated from the Institute of African and Asian Studies at the Moscow State University from 1990 to 2021. Sorry, from 1990 to 2021, he was a lecturer at this institute. He was also a researcher at the All Soviet Institute of Scientific and Technical Information. From 2008 to 2012, he was the director of the International Center for Korean Studies at the Moscow State University. He is a specialist on economy and works as a consultant on economic issues for the Russian embassies and the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He is currently a counselor of the Russian Embassy in North Korea, where he has been working for over six years in this capacity, and is a consultant for the Russian Embassy in Seoul. Dr. Leshakov, thank you very much for having accepted our invitation to share your knowledge and experience on the matter in this forum. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you. It's my pleasure to join your esteemed company and greetings from Seoul. I'm in Korean Peninsula now, but not in the north and the south. And uh, actually, um, much of my life was devoted to North Korea. Uh, I already mentioned that I, uh, my first visit to North Korea was in 1977. Um, concerning the, today's topic, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that at the end of this year, we'll uh, uh, see, we'll celebrate, or uh, we'll mark the first decade of uh, Chairman Kim Jong-un leadership of uh, uh, North Korea, which is uh, actually the official name is Democratic People's Republic of Korea. And that was very interesting days uh, because uh, the country uh, uh, witnessed very interesting changes, especially in, in economics. Uh, this, in March uh, 2013, his father's Kim Jong Un uh, military first Song Un policy was replaced by Pyongyang Jin, uh, parallel development of economy and uh, uh, building nuclear arsenal. Actually, the same uh, or similar uh, strategy was taken by his grandfather Kim Il Sung in the 60s when he was trying to create an uh, independent country from China and from the Soviet Union. After a series of uh, uh, tests uh, of warheads, uh, nuclear warheads, and successful launches of uh, ballistic missiles, in uh, December of 2017, uh, Kim Jong Un declared complete uh, build up of state nuclear forces. And uh, later in April uh, to, uh, 2018, plenary meeting of uh, Korea's Workers' Party declared uh, that all efforts of the party and the country would be concentrated on socialist economic and construction. Actually, the, the uh, word socialist appeared for, for, <clears throat> for the first time for many years in this uh, statement. Uh, the transition from uh, military first to people-centered policies was confirmed by the eight party congress held in January uh, 2021. Uh, the shift in uh, strategies resulted in very interesting uh, developments. Uh, major of them I could mention first. Uh, during his father's rule, Kim Jong Un, uh, the economic management system was dispersed between cabinet, between Korean Party and the working party and the military. Uh, Kim Jong Un tried to unify the system and centered it on the cabinet. It's uh, one important thing. Another significant uh, thing was the uh, uh, increase of autonomy of enterprises and collective farms. 
uh, uh, during the Kim Jong Un uh, rule, um, socialist enterprise responsibility system and farm responsibility management systems were introduced in the country. Uh, one of the important uh, changes was uh, marketization of the economy through uh, creation of different channels of distribution. Actually, the so-called Madan uh, or private uh, markets, actually they were already exist during his father's uh, period of ruling, but uh, during Kim Jong-un period, uh, they, uh, there was a system created uh, and they were uh, expanded uh, enormously. <clears throat> Uh, this expansion of uh, private uh, markets led to the uh, increase in uh, 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 and to the uh, establishment creation of labor market and financial market. And uh, at the same time, the expansion of uh, foreign trade uh, companies and promotion of uh, or trying to promote uh, or to attract foreign, uh, foreign investment to the country. And uh, one, uh, one more important uh, phenomenon was uh, dollarization of the country. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the, that means the substitution of local currency with stable uh, foreign currencies due to inflation, uh, especially after the uh, failed attempt to uh, make a, uh, <clears throat> a one in, in 2000, uh, 2009. And, uh, uh, <clears throat> the long history of mismanagement of uh, current economy. Um, in fact, uh, according to the estimate of uh, Korean Development Institute, since 2013, around half of the ordinary uh, North Koreans uh, have relied on Chinese yuan. So we could say it's not dollarization, but more yuanization of the country as a local currency. Uh, and uh, also for daily economic activities. Uh, to summarize, uh, Chairman Kim Jong-un's strategy was aimed at achieving economic growth through the expansion of market system while maintaining the uh, regime's stability through strengthening of uh, government management of economy. Uh, expansion of actors involved in foreign trade and more autonomous uh, given to Autonomy given to trade related uh, entities boosted foreign trade, which grew 20% uh, in 2012 uh, 2014, reaching the its peak of uh, $7.6 billion in 2014. And if you include the inter Korean community, it was around $9 billion. Uh, more openness to world market. Uh, mainly to Chinese market, led to rapid rise of consumer goods and food imports, uh, emergence of private market network and growing uh, consumerism of uh, Korean people, enhanced uh, by free circulation of cash foreign currencies and for availability of uh, new goods on the market. All these were very important phenomena and uh, uh, along with uh, experts, major source for hard currency, for Korean, uh, well, North Korean labor sent uh, abroad to work. Uh, there were more than uh, 100,000 uh, people working in China, Russia, and uh, Middle East and other countries. Uh, all those developments were in principle favorable for business activities and potential uh, and beneficially uh, for potential foreign uh, investors, uh, foreign traders. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, uh, strict uh, international and bilateral sanctions imposed on the country uh, since 2017 for, purchase, uh, for pursuing nuclear and missile program has left uh, little room for North Korea to engage with the world economy. Uh, moreover, suicidal restriction of cross-border movement introduced by the regime at the outbreak of COVID pandemic uh, has worsened the situation to, to the point of, I guess, no return. In order to survive sanction and pandemic, Eighth Party Congress emphasized as its major strategy, self-rehabilitation, self-sufficiency, uh, and uh, actually uh, that was the preparation people for another other march, which they uh, envisaged in uh, late 1990. Uh, 
in fact, uh, the North Korea has gone back to this uh, hermit kingdom, which is what uh, uh, usually mentioned during the long, long period. Uh, of course, uh, North Korean re-engagement re uh, with outside world, especially is uh, with the legal businesses activity, business activities, is totally dependent on lifting of uh, international sanctions as well as successful combating of COVID pandemics. Uh, the, the possibilities of those changes in the nearest future highly unlikely, and moreover, even though uh, the sanction and pandemic are over due to many uncertainties and risk, as well as specific mentality of local business crippled by outside restrictions and by local zigzag policies. Economic uh, cooperation with North Korea uh, will be a very uh, difficult road. Uh, and that's why I, sh I, I guess that uh, the first place in, the, uh, in this engagement should be started by state-owned entities or uh, non-governmental organizations rather than private companies because the risks are very uh, serious, very high there. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, the situation now is uh, like it was described uh, 20 years ago by uh, distinguished uh, American Koranist uh, Marcus Noland when he said that uh, there are two ways uh, the engagement, which could uh, lead to the uh, quick development of uh, North Korea and just uh, the isolation, which will uh, just, just uh, the country will jug, be jugging on uh, with this, with this uh, uh, situation of poverty, of uh, hardships and problems. And uh, uh, just uh, to prove my uh, I should say that while staying in uh, North Korea from 2013 to 2017, and uh, the first part of this uh, of the first years was, I would say, the golden uh, age for the, the businesses, including uh, foreign businesses. Unfortunately, that uh, ended. Uh, there were some. Uh, <clears throat> there were some uh, while working in Pyongyang. Uh, uh, we have several joint projects in trade and investments with uh, North Koreans, uh, both by uh, private companies and by state companies. And unfortunately, I should say that uh, none of these, those projects was a success story. Uh, so uh, concerning the tourism, even the tourism, which is the easiest way to attract uh, foreign business, there are some uh, problems like uh, bad roads and that means that uh, transportation is very tiresome for the tourists if you go from Pyongyang to Wonsan which is the uh, base so it, it takes uh, three hours on a very bad road and you will be very very exhausted and the problem is uh, the uh, internet which is not available so uh, the country is could be explored for tourists just exclusive tourists who are just collecting countries or who are just like Russians maybe who are have some memories of the Soviet Union or Chinese who have some memories of their future elder generation, which could go go back to the in, in like a, the time machine. So, and uh, concerning the trust between uh, you ask the trust between uh, South and North, unfortunately, there is no trust. We should be frank, and uh, uh, it 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 will take a long time to uh, establish the trust, and we would say that. Uh, we are we are looking for the peaceful uh, unification, uh, but in fact, uh, the, we should uh, see that uh, uh, both countries they uh, consider this unification by uh, uh, just take, overtaking the whole territory. And uh, the one important thing which was made on the uh, the, eight, the last congress is they, that they uh, stop. Uh, trying to expand the uh, revolution to the south. That means that uh, we, we should uh, better think and discuss not unification, but peaceful coexistence of the two countries. Uh, concerning the products, unfortunately, all those products which, are, uh, with, which could be interested for exporting and even importing to the country, they're almost uh, all under the sanctions. Uh, so 
Uh, I think that's uh, all what I was planning to say. And I would very be uh, glad if you have any questions for my presentation. Thank you very much. Mrs. Diableo, please unmute yourself. Oh, I'm very sorry. Yeah. Uh, so am I on now? Yes, yes. Thank you, Dr. Leshakov, for your excellent presentation and uh, for listening to this many uh, major developments that help, happened during uh, this first part of Kim Jong-un's uh, rule. Uh, I would like to ask you a question. Uh, you mentioned that in the Communist Party Congress last January, they uh, strengthened one of the major developments that was to go from a dispersed economic management system to a centralized economic management system centered on the cabinet. And that at the same time, they have confirmed the increase of the autonomy of enterprises and collective farms. So the question would be, isn't the centralization of the economic management system in some way contradictory to an increase of the autonomy of enterprises and collective farms? Uh, thank you. I don't think that's a contradiction because the problem with Kim Jong-il was that he gave some piece of economics like a fishery to the militaries and they make profits uh, uh, from that but they don't share it with the government maybe uh, some of the uh, uh, industries were given to the party and some and managed by the party and some were managed by the uh, uh, cabinet and that create many problems so now they have a more uh, how to say understandable uh, system when all economics is ruled not by the party not by the military but by the cabinet. Uh, and it's, uh, it's not uh, directly related with the uh, autonomy of uh, enterprises and autonomy of uh, uh, collective farms. Uh, actually, uh, uh, the autonomy of uh, these entities mean that they could uh, uh, get some of the products uh, which they made and uh, uh, sell it on the market and they could decide uh, what to uh, produce, how many to produce, and uh, uh, so have some planning, the planning of, uh, of management. That, that's important. Uh, we, uh, when I stay in Pyongyang, we visited uh, a collective farm, which was a French, friendship farm of the uh, Russian embassy. And we see that the uh, chief of that, uh, collective farm, he was uh, a decision maker. He changed uh, because they were placed not far from the uh, Pyongyang. So they changed from grain production mainly to uh, vegetable production because they could sell it on the uh, Pyongyang market. So uh, there are some, there were some interesting changes uh, at that period. But unfortunately now as uh, the situation is going from bad to worse, uh, maybe they will be going back to this uh, uh, how to say, uh, in Russia we have the same period which was called the, uh, when the, the government take everything from the entities, yes. It was okay. called the uh, military communism, it was called. <laughs> yes. Thank you for clarifying this point. And we'll have more time later on, uh, the time of question and answer session. Thank you. Uh, I would like to lead on to our next speaker, Mr. Herbert Friesacker. After completing his studies in Vienna, Austria, Mr. Friesacker worked as a journalist in various publications in Vienna. From 86 to 89, he was a freelance journalist for various Austrian newspapers and magazines with a focus on Central and Eastern Europe. From 89 to 91, he was the European correspondent for Segio Irbo, a South Korean daily newspaper. From 91 to 2009, 19, sorry, that is for 30 years, he worked as an agent at the Korean Trade Investment Promotion Agency called COTRA, a Korean government organization for trade. 
and Investment, where he was a senior manager and advisor to the Korean Trade Commissioner. He was also responsible for press coordination and conducted research into North Korea. He's currently a private research consultant. You can also see his bio on the chat. Mr. Frizaker, it's an honor to have you in this panel and we are looking forward to your presentation. Welcome. So, so everyone can hear me. Yes. Well, I say I say hello to all the participants and say also thanks to the organizer for inviting me to this webinar as well as to UPF, the brain behind. When we are doing business with certain countries. And it's important to know the cultural, the economic, the business background, as well the business objectives. It is good to know the, about the political situation, the laws, the restrictions, and also the business specialities in the country. I will give some insights. I will give some insights in North Korea's strategic economic goals for the immediate and midterm future based on the resolutions of the eight DPRK party congress in January this year. Mr. Leshekov already mentioned about, about the party congress, which uh, was uh, at last 2016 and now in January 2021 this year. General Secretary Kim Jong-un announced in this Congress certain measures the country has to follow for chance of survival politically and also economically. But in Kim's explanation with 60,000 words, there are no indicates that pragmatism and market-oriented reform have been chosen as solutions. I will focus on 10 essential economic goals I recognized as important from the viewpoint of the DPRK government in the new five-year plan. So in this context, uh, I'm thankful to Professor Frank. It's the head of the East Asian Institute of Economy from the University in Vienna, who has always updated information regarding the North Korean studies, and I prefer to use. Okay, then let's start with the 10 economic goals. The first, the foreign trade and uh, private sector business. The trade statistic shows a dramatic development on country the country is facing now. North Korea imports decreased 45% from 2019 to 2020. Export decreased 72%. Also to the, the pilot, bilateral trade with China decreased more than 70%. These are figures from the World Trade Atlas. Due to the sanctions policy, Kim Jong-un has decided to search for solutions domestically. The main strategy for the upcoming five-year plan seems to be domestic production of inputs, in other words, import substitution. This coincides with the North Korean Chuche ideology, what means self-reliance, to keep and develop the country in autarky. That means active trade with North Korea could be a challenging matter. And regarding the private sector business, it's uh, Kim Jong-un's intention to reduce the influence of private and semi-private economic activities. He reintroduced the dominance of the state, the ideology, uh, the politics in the economy. But why this measure? Maybe we can discuss later about. Second, the industry. Metal and chemical industries are identified as the key elements of economic development. Both are typically for a socialist economy and reminds me of a similar strategy used by South Korea in the 1970s. Under the current situation of economic isolation, import substitution in this field does have its merits. 
as the products of these industries are key inputs for many other sectors too. North Korea is in the fortunate position of having most mineral resources needed for operating its own metal and chemical industries. Plans to substitute crude oil with alternative inputs like coal have been promoted for many years in official publications. However, such industries require major investments of capital and technology, and they need export markets to operate profitably. What about agriculture? For agriculture, Kim emphasized that state procurement levels must reach the 2019 level with the next two, three years. This can be interpreted both as a call to increase grain production, but also as a desire to reduce the share of grain traded freely on the market and return to the dominance of the state distribution through rationing system or through state subsidized shops. Interesting point is uh, afforestation. Kim Jong-un's report about forestry indicating a relatively high priority. It was reported that about 1 million hectares of land were reforested. In the time of the discussion about climate change worldwide, Kim Jong-un might give also a sign to the international, international community that North Korea is making efforts regarding CO2 reduction, or maybe it can be seen as an attraction to the world that North Korea is gaining for international financing for. One thing is a fact, North Korea lost huge areas of forest through the war and later through firewood. Reforestation should also stabilize the soil and avert landslides what affect every year the North Korean agriculture. The construction industry. Construction actively seems to be also very important. Kim mentioned 50,000 new flats to be constructed in Pyongyang and 25,000 new houses in the Komdok mining area, which is also the location of an infamous labor camp. In this context, Kim announced that the target of producing 8 million tons of cement during the next five year plan. It's quite huge. Number six, the next point. Uh, he will focus on rural areas and the local level. In his explanation, Kim Jong-un seems to be strongly focusing on developing local areas. Parallels to the South Korean developments come in mind, especially an initiative in the early 1970s under the dictatorship of Park Chung-hee. This was called the New Village Movement. It aimed at reducing the gap between the quality of life in urban and rural areas by such measures as improving infra infrastructure like roads or bridges, replacing thatched roofs with more durable materials, and promoting healthcare, education, and culture. Specif specific economic policy measures in this regard, including the supply of cement for construction to the local areas. Next point is the development of mobile communica communi uh, communication and the ICT. Kim, Kim's demand is to introduce the next generation mobile communication. Cable broadcasting is promoted as a way to supply better entertainment to the people, but it is also a convenient way for the state to control the media, the media consumption of its citizens. In this context, it is also to mention that North Korea invited foreign telecommunication companies to be active in North Korea. For instance, also come from Egypt. They developed in a joint venture with Coriolink the telecommunication system and the Chinese UOA secretly helped build North Korea's wireless communication. Also not to forget the well-developed North Korean IT companies who are specialized in production of software as well as animations for Western companies. And also during the COVID-19 time, North Korea developed their own video conferencing system. And they made efforts also for remote meeting and, and telemedicine and remote education systems. 
the tourism. Tourism is to be promoted with two objectives in mind. First, make the people enjoy to have a more civilized life, which could either mean the development of domestic tourism or to gain revenues for local hospitality industries through foreign visitors. And second, to spread the, change, the changing image of the country to the world. In other words, for propaganda purposes. And the Mount Kumgang Resort in the Southeast is mentioned specifically in Kim's report in the party Congress. After a visit by Kim Jong-un before the party Congress recently, it seems North Korea indeed intends to rebuild these tourism facilities, but the question is for whom? This will raise questions in South Korea about the possibility of continued cooperation and the ownership of South Korean assets. The next point, uh, they are planning to create a nuclear power industry. And this is relatively a logical step, considering North Korea has chronic problems with the production of energy. North Korea has its own domestic uranium reserves and has made substantial progress in nuclear technology over the past few decades. Plans to provide nuclear power have existed already since 1994. And then we are coming to the, the last goal. This is, this is the relationship to China. And in these remarks on foreign policy and foreign trade, Kim spoke positively about the prospects for diplomatic and economic cooperation with the socialist countries, which seems to indicate the hope for closer cooperation mainly with China. This is not very surprising considering the few opportunities North Korea currently has and China's ability at the United Nations Security Council to veto the enactment of further sanctions on North Korea. Well, in summary, this is the track North Korea uh, economy might follow in the midterm future. Finally, the most important question, can these resolutions of the last DPRK Party Congress really boost business activities? My answer, I doubt it but things can always change. And maybe there are some other opinions. Well, and I would like to, uh, to hear this picture. This is Cho Man Sik. He is just behind me. He is a freedom fighter against the Japanese colonization. And this statue is in the, at the Unification Tower uh, in Odosan, close to the city Bachu and the North Korean border. He points with his finger to heaven, symbolically as a warning to North and South Korea to do their best for reunification. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frizacker. Wonderful presentation with many concrete points. And I'm sure there will be many, many questions from the audience. Meanwhile, I have a question to you. In regard to foreign trade, one of the points you mentioned, you said that the main strategy for the upcoming five-year plan seems to be import substitution. So the question is, is this import substitution to be based just on the public enterprises or will it include an increase of private production activities? Uh, well, Basically, North Korea, their supply chain is, is also planned. As a, as a trader, you have um, almost very less opportunities to, to export to North Korea. And what North Korea needs, they are searching for. They have embassies all over the world in about 40, 45 countries about. And they are searching for their products they need. Usually, if we, if we hear this, this presentation, uh, we can say, OK, there are so many, so many uh, opportunities in the, in the field of, for instance, 
for instance, uh, in the private sector business or in the, in the field of industry, there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, but North Korea itself, they can, they can, they have so many raw materials, so many base products, they can use it for their industry they, they have. Um, compared to South Korea, South Korea almost has has almost not, no no raw materials yeah for the industry. North Korea has everything, and uh, they can substitute. But well, they also need to. Uh, they also need, I I think, a lot of uh, capital, and they need also technologies. Uh, to come forward. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, so I would like now to invite our third speaker, Mr. Tal Reshef, a former director of the Asia Israel Business Forum, Emerging Markets, Markets Business Consultant and lecturer from Israel. Mr. Reshef is an expert in conducting business in the emerging markets of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. He is specialized in acquisition and import, negotiation, recruitment, management, and relocation of employees, and recruitment of investors. Currently, he's the editor of Guide to the Importer from China and a columnist on business and economics in East Asia. Thank you, Mr. Reshef, for being with us today. And we are very much looking forward to your contribution to the discussion. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, uh, special thanks to the two uh, distinguished speakers that preceded me. Uh, I learned a lot. And uh, in fact, they uh, said better than I could many things that I was uh, thinking of saying. Uh, and the bottom line, I guess uh, it's quite clear to all of us, is that the potential of uh, the opening of uh, DPRK to, to the world trade, or alternatively, uh, um, the, the uh, joining to, to South Korea into a unified country, each one of them carries a, a huge potential. Uh, it carries big obstacles, each one of them. There are ways to tackle the, uh, the obstacles. And uh, there is a debate over the chances to uh, overcome those uh, obstacles. Uh, but there's something that precedes all those points. And this is the point of the management. And I guess when we deal with the DPRK and with the potential of the DPRK, in our case, the, the commercial and economic uh, potential, the point of the uh, management and the leadership is uh, crucial. Uh, my daily work, I work with Israeli companies in front of uh, emerging markets. And usually when we are dealing me with the company that hired me into working with uh, one uh, company or another, we are dealing a lot with intercultural issues. These companies from Brazil or from Spain or from Korea and the culture of the local of this country is a, an issue. Sometimes it may happen that you are dealing with a company that is owned by one person, no shareholders. He's not the, the decision maker, he's the only decision maker. Once you get to such a situation in business, uh, your focus stops being on culture and starts being on psychology. You need to understand this person more than anything else in order to achieve your business goals. And this is exactly what happens now with the DPRK. The DPRK is not, unlike Vietnam and China that were uh, mentioned, is not a communist country, I stress, I stress. It is not a socialist country. It is not a, a party country, uh, even though it carries the name of uh, People's Republic and Communist Party and all those titles, in fact, it is a dictatorship, a dictatorship uh, ruled by one person, son of the previous dictator, uh, and who was uh, preceded by his uh, father at the times and so on. This is a dynasty. This is a dictatorship. And uh, everybody who knows history of regimes knows that dealing with uh, Nazi Germany at the time was dealing with Adolf Hitler. That was the Führer Prinzip. 
the question, what, what does Hitler want? And the same goes with Mao Zedong in China in the 50s and 60s, with Saddam Hussein in Iraq later on, Mussolini and so on, there are many, many uh, examples. And uh, when one person carries the, the only decision-making of the country, uh, the question is no longer what is the will of the country, what is the will of the nation? There's another question, what is the will of the person? There is no uh, interest of the country, even though it is somewhere there and plays some this or that role, but the main issue is what is the interest of the person? And this is what happened in Saddam Hussein, who was uh, fighting his own uh, war over the, the, the paying price of the nation. The same goes with uh, uh, Kim Jong-un. He's got his interest. We have to understand his interest. If we can give him an answer to his wishes, if we can give him an answer of to his fears, fear is the strongest motivation of, uh, of any person, and uh, then all this potential can come true, can come out to the light. And uh, his fear, his uh, wishes, his um, interest focuses mainly before getting to the economical point on survival. He's afraid. Kim Jong-un is an afraid person. He's a fearful person. He's afraid of one thing, the rope, the rope, because the rope is quite often the destiny of the dictator. And he, he knows that no matter what a pact, no matter what um, agreement he signs with the Americans, with the Japanese, with the Koreans, or with the Russians, in, whenever he loses the regime, whenever DPRK is uh, uh, emerged into uh, South Korea, or uh, open to ideas from the West because of openness of uh, commerce and information and internet and so on, uh, his days are counted. And once he's out of uh, the power, uh, on a given moment, the trial will take place. And after the trial comes the road, because his crimes are incredible, are incredible. A, a, a nation of tens of millions of people suffering from starvation because of him and his uh, luxurious uh, style of life. So whenever we are talking about openness of DPRK to, to the world this way or another, we need to find a way to assure him that even after he loses control over the power, and he will, if any of those modifications will take place, he will stay alive. Now I come with my estimation, my personal estimation, there's nothing we can guarantee. There's no way we can guarantee him that the agreement will be stronger than the law against crimes or against humanity once he's out of power. So I'm afraid I'm the pessimistic person. To, well, I'm not the only pessimistic, as you could see, but I'm afraid I'm very pessimistic. As long as there is no internal coup d'etat inside of DPRK, as long as Mr. Uh, Kim Jong-un, and as long as the dynasty of the Kim family does not lose control of the DPRK, I don't see this opening happens in any way, despite the potential, which I agree is huge, and despite the ways to tackle the obstacle, which I agree exist. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Reshef, for for being uh, with us and clarifying indeed many aspects of Kim Jong-un's psychological profile. And of course, the consequences that it has for him and for the, the nation that he is leading. Um, I also would like to ask you a question according to your analysis that the ruler's motivation is a key factor to introduce changes in economy. Uh, how could Kim Jong-un personally become interested in promoting trade and business activities in North Korea? Uh, first of all, it is clear that this uh, openness will benefit with this North Korean uh, economy. There's no doubt about it, and there's a huge potential for the North Korean economy. Together with this comes the danger of opening the DPRK people uh, to ideas from South Korea on from the West in general, that uh, uh, unbalances the throne 
of uh, the Kim dynasty. So um, this is possible only if we think of a way that will open DPRK to the world in a way that Vietnam and China did, by uh, together with assuring that new ideas will not come in and change the inner situation in the DPRK. Vietnam and China were able to do that because they are not dictatorship. They are um, party regimes. And in a party regime, there is a balance of powers inside of the party and inside of the regime that allows moving on and back and doing the right thing in order to be open and close on the same time uh, on the ways that you want. When it deals with one person, it is more complex, but if we or if Mr. Kim finds a solution to this opening without endangering him, yes, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. is the solution. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I have received several questions for the speakers. And um, I would like to start with, uh, with in, the, in the same order in which you spoke. Uh, the first question, so, would go to um, um, Dr. Rashev. Sorry, Dr. Uh, Leshakov, sorry. Um, the question is regarding the money coming from North Koreans working abroad, do we know which part of the economy it is going to go? Does it, finances the, does it finance the nuclear built up? This would go to Dr. Leshakov. Uh. I should say that uh, some of the money uh, were, were going because uh, due to the um, UN resolution now, these uh, workers are either are working illegally or, or not working. But uh, previously they received uh, uh, salaries, which uh, some say half, but it's not important because uh, we have the same uh, system in the Soviet Union. We, when uh, we were uh, working abroad, part of the money which we received will go into the state. So this is the same situation, but uh, why I think these uh, sanctions are um, uh, ruining the, uh, just the emerging small business in, uh, in North Korea, because even though they uh, paid half or maybe some part of the, they received money to the government, they, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, rest is left with them. And uh, they could use it uh, while going back to the country. They, they could use it to make up small businesses in construction or in uh, car repairs or something like this. Uh, actually, I know that uh, those workers who work for four to five years in uh, Russia, they could uh, accumulate some five, four or five or even up to 8,000 if they work additionally, uh, $8,000. That were huge money uh, as a start startup money for doing some small business in Korea. Now all this ruined. That's why by, that means that by these sanctions, UN sanctions, they are ruining the, uh, the just the, the small business. They, they are ruining marketing in, in North Korea. But uh, as for the nuclear uh, program, they need more um, uh, brains than money. Uh, you know, the, the most important thing when in Russia we were making nuclear project, that was mathematicians who were uh, the most important, not the money. The same in, in Korea. They have good mathematicians and they could get money, right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Leshakov. And my next question would go to um, Mr. Friesacher. Which sector of the economy would be a good fit for business cooperation between North and South Korea? Any examples of projects between the two Koreas? Excuse me, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry. So I remember the time of the uh, economic project Kaesong. And uh, this was a real hope for, for closer, for closer, coming closer for both countries. 
And I myself, I had also, this was, I, I, I will a little bit explain. I put myself had a chance through Cotra for marketing for this project uh, and inform local companies about the opportunities uh, to invest there. And it was a, a, by the way, it was a golden time. I also could invite journalists and journalists came there to see the Kaesung area. The Kaesung area is, uh, is close to the South Korean border in North Korea was established uh, 2000, starting 2002 and came in production 2004. Well, uh, at the Kaesong, it was established in full operation until 2013 and uh, they had a short break and, and then continu continued until 2016. And then it was closed uh, according to certain, certain uh, reasons. So North Korea made at that time an uh, investment of a volume of 800 million US dollar, uh, 200, 120, 250 companies were working in that area and uh, 50, more than 50,000 workers from North Korea came every day in the zone for, for, for production. And uh, North Korea provided the land, labor and South Korea arranged the capital, the infrastructure, and the technology and the materials. So thus, a poor country could um, materially benefit from this location next, next to the door and uh, at, for advanced in national in industrial economy and vice versa. So uh, if North Korea and South Korea and also uh, the international community can force both Koreas again to open uh, Kaesong. Kaesong is waiting. Basically, everything is there. But I also heard that uh, there are some progress and uh, there are discussions. And uh, such improvements also can help to open the pro project again, not only for making money, but also to create a momentum for the Korean peace process as the architects intended. And the architect was Kim Dae-chung. Kim Dae-chung, he uh, was president until 2003, and he was he received for, for that cooperation for Kaesong and also for Kumyang area, he received the Nobel Prize. So it's a certain activity which, which basically was an amazing, amazing project. But nowadays, nowadays everything is, is closed. The only thing for making business is that North Korea is searching for products and uh, companies in, in the Western world can react. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Mr. Frizacker, for your answer. I have some other questions that are directed, that are addressed to the three speakers, actually. Do the speakers see the possibility of what I would call a miracle event with regards to North Korea in the same way as the miracle of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union happen? Um, could there be some sudden and unexpected events that will spark dramatic changes in North Korea? Uh, this is for any of you. And uh, if you feel we'll inspired, be happy to, to try to tackle it uh, quite shortly. Uh, I, since as I um, presented the issue of DPRK is the issue of uh, one person, such a miracle can be only something that happens to such a person. Uh, the situation can change to a possible openness. If, for instance, uh, Mr. Uh, Kim uh, suffers from a heart attack and passes away just in, as an example, or if there is a coup d'etat like there was during the, the regime of a Nazi a, a time with the, the Valkyrie a, operation a, to remove Mr. Hitler. A, I guess only a removal of uh, the head of the state might uh, be such a miracle as uh, your, your pre the, the question is asking. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have another question. Oh, sorry, you want to say something, Mr. Frizzaco? Uh, yes. yes uh, 
Um, sorry. Yeah. Uh, actually, I've heard in the North, in South Korea there is a famous fortune teller which is telling that uh, in several days, uh, in several years, uh, Korea will be united. I'm not a fortune teller, but I think it's very, very uh, how to say uh, so. Uh, so uh, Korea, uh, we are waiting for this collapse for more than 20 years without uh, uh, seeing it. So uh, I think it's a very, how to say, uh, not, uh, we, we couldn't say it, it, would, it, happen, it could happen, yeah. So. Thank you. And Mr. Frizaker, you yes. have something to say. I, I think the Chuche, the, the North Korean ideology, the Chuche ideology, is so much strong into the in the in the heart into the brain in of the people and the North Koreans also have a very uh, Confucianism background and this might be totally dif difficult to that we can expect there can be some some uh, sudden change. I know a lot of uh, diplomats and businessmen. They said, yeah, probably in, in 20, 30 years, there may be some change. But uh, what can happen is that uh, North Korea come more and more uh, in connection to China. And if it happened, then North Korea probably can develop their economy. But also the North Korean leader has to, to change his mind to really to, to have an economy like the Chinese economy. Uh, uh, Chinese economy was was established. Thank you. Thank you. I have uh, several other questions and as we have some good time yet ahead of us, uh, if you like, uh, I will keep asking you questions. Uh, one of them is, um, let me see, let's imagine that a change happens in the uh, in North Korea leadership, and you are called as advisors to change the economic system, where would you start? W which uh, measures and, uh, you would take? If I can uh, try to answer it, I guess if I was an advisor to the North Korean regime and being asked such a question, I would uh, suggest them to start from developing tools for control of communication with the world. Uh, their tools for the moment are not so, so strong because the level of uh, technology is not so strong. The control of the internet is not as strong as the Chinese one, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, the control of uh, North Koreans traveling abroad or other people coming into the country and so on, for the moment, it's based on listening to phone lines, reading uh, letters and uh, detecting uh, people, just as in Stalin's time uh, at the 50s, uh, it's backwards. And if they want to open up and still maintain control of what is happening inside and on the D ideas that are flowing inside, uh, they need to advance on uh, communication control on the technology level. Thank you. Any other ideas? From yes. Mr. Frizaka? Yeah, I would try to bring together all those all those gentlemen and the presidents who were in their position, who made the change in Eastern Europe. <laughs> I, will, I will start probably from Bulgaria, from Czech Republic, and, and also maybe in, in Russia, Mr. Gorbachev, or also maybe Putin can help. And there are uh, many, many uh, presidents from the past, those did a good job, I think so. Thank you, very good idea. Dr. Leshakov, would you have any? I think I will not suit for to be in the, uh, but I think they need uh, uh, some uh, consultant from south part of uh, peninsula. They could make a miracle. They have made miracle on Hangan River and they could help them to make miracle on Dedongan River as well. Thank you. Actually, then the next question has a little bit to do with uh, your answer. Uh, what is the likelihood of the two Koreas being united 
under the same political regime, what kind of political regime would this prospect bring about? This is the $1 billion question. Yes. The South Koreans are expecting such unification to be in a South Korean way, which means democracy and human rights. Uh, the, the North Koreans are expecting to do it in the Marxist way, or maybe in the, the dictatorship way, I don't know. Uh, but uh, it is clear that uh, such a, the, a very clear formula is not possible if we do it in a democratic way, in an open market way. Uh, the, 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 the North Koreans will be the exhibit in a natural reserve visited by the rich visitors from other countries. Uh, it will be a humiliation. It will be a blow in their face. It, it is a bad answer even though many people think that this will be an answer, I don't see it happening. Um, to be honest, I don't know. Yes. I, this is the most honest I can be. Yes. You said at the beginning, it's a very uh, hard question. Any yeah, other? Uh, yes, uh, I would like to uh, add, uh, as I already mentioned, there are some very interesting changes now, at, at least in the North, uh, uh, because they are now not speaking about the revolution on the south they are speaking about it, uh, living together that means that there is a change from uh, because south korea was trying to overtake the north and the north also was uh, trying to uh, thinking of the united korea as, uh, as overtaken uh, uh, south korea, especially after the uh, developments in afghanistan but now uh, uh, they are speaking about coexistence and that means that maybe they could go back to the proposals which were given long long time ago by the grandfather of Kim Jong-un of making a kind of a first step like a confeder confederation of uh, two states with different political and social systems. Yes, thank you. Cooperation, which they started long ago, but it was never really successful. Yes. I have uh, an interesting question here, uh, and it's for the three of you. Will not North Korea adopt the Chinese model in developing special economic zones? Can it be successful in North Korea as it was in, in China? I should start saying that uh, it, it wasn't su successful already because uh, if I'm not mistaken, in uh, 2013, there were uh, some 13 uh, free economic zone arranged in different part of the country, but they didn't uh, to attract foreign investors, but uh, it didn't work uh, because of uh, uh, in, 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 in competence of uh, the people who, had, who were doing it from the, from the one point of view on, and on the other hand from the uh, strengthening uh, sanctions uh, from international community. Thank you, Dr. Leshakov. Mr. Frizaker, would you like to say something? Well, I think so that uh, they tried to make, as Mr. Leshakov said, the economic, the work for the economic zones. They had three. Uh, there's one in the, in the Northeast, this is Brachin. And I don't know exactly what's going on there. It's, we don't have so much information. I know that, the, that Russia also uh, made the construction with the railway construction over there. I heard also that, that China uh, took over the, the board for 40 years. And it's the question, what's going on there? I really don't know. The other, the other um, is uh, on, the, on the Yalu River. The, the, this bridge to China, they also they expect to, to make a, a economic zone. And well, I propose that they are so clever and start again with, with Kaesong. Kaesong really was a peace project. And it's the question if they should start again, because this really was a business opportunity. And when the Kaesong project was opened, many, many other businesses developed. And I remember this was the time when, the, when we had the highest turnover of, of international trade with, with, with North Korea. I propose reopen of Kaesong. 
his song. Okay. And Mr. Reshef, would you like to say anything? Uh, yes, I think that uh, if we take the example of uh, China, of uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, creating special zones and compare it to the DPRK of today, we have two great differences that uh, might uh, lead us to, uh, uh, to what we heard right now with, uh, from Mr. Friesacher. And this is, first of all, uh, China is not the DPRK. The DPRK has got a little bit more than 20 million persons. China at that time, at the beginning of the 80s, uh, it, it was uh, already a nation of uh, 1 billion person or more. So the potential was incredible enough for big international companies to take the risk. And they knew they were taking the risk and invest in China. A nation, a market of 22 million people is not such a huge potential and international companies are not ready to take risk when entering into such a small uh, market. And the second point is the difference of personalities. Uh, Deng Xiaoping was an old man at that time. He had a lot of power. He knew that his days are counted. It was after dozens of years after the regime of Mao Zedong, when he was trying to create the reforms and Mao Zedong avoided it by any means that he had and he did any, many. So Deng Xiaoping was motivated by the will to achieve a huge difference in the history of China in a very short time, and he did. I don't recognize that Mr. Kim has a motivation of that kind. Thank you. Thank you for your answers. And I think this, the next one is going to be our last question um, related to, to economy, of course. Um, the easiest way to, be, to become uh, a developing country is to develop the private sector. Is there any expectation that that will happen in North Korea? Yeah, well, as, as I said in my presentation, uh, Kim Jong-un is reducing the influence of private and semi-private uh, economic activities currently. And he reintroduced uh, the ideology of the state and the politics uh, over, over economy. And uh, as we already mentioned, in the last two decades, hundreds of restaurants, also from Vienna, we had a restaurant on the Kim Il-sung uh, state just behind, or Italian restaurants were open, and small shops, uh, transportation businesses, and, and other services have emerged in, in North Korea. Uh, and officially, they are operated by, by state entities, but basically these are privately owned businesses. Uh, and these people, they made this, they already um, could reach a substantial economic power. They became rich, they also became master of, of money. And that could be transformed into, into political influence. And now Kim Jong-un might curb, this is a, a dangerous trend and, and try to install more state control over services and, and over the commercial sector. And, uh, but it might be interesting uh, for the future uh, to know, it would be interesting to know how, we, how Kim Jong-il will implement, implement this practice and what will be, what will be the re response by the affected business owners. And uh, well, in this uh, concluding message also, Kim Jong-un strongly called the party to see the economic management uh, from a strict political perspective and not only focus on the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact is that in North Korea already some big states owned players are, are like the airline Koryo, the Koryo airline or Air Koryo. Uh, and they expanding to taxi, they expanding to beverages, they also make uh, fuel supply businesses. And uh, some also speak there are already existing some small travels in North Korea, but, but they are not too big to fail. I think so that uh, Kim Jong-un can say, okay, no, we stop this. But well, if this, would be if this can continue, 
it will be a matter of time until they might become real chebols. But I think uh, Kim Jong Un will not accept this. Thank you, Mr. Frizakar. Any other comments on this question? Uh, actually, North Koreans are business minded, and even uh, many uh, from North Korea uh, who uh, migrated to South Korea, they make huge fortune, like Chon Ju Yeon, the founder of Hyundai. Uh, but the problem is environment, and all depends on the environment. If uh, the political environment will be changing, if sanctions will be lifted. So I think there is a huge potential of private mm -hmm. uh, development in North Korea. Thank you. And Mr. Reshev. I could only agree with my colleagues in what they say. I don't have anything else to, to add to it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the presentations and the discussion have been very, very valuable and have helped us to better understand the possibilities for a sustainable economic development in North Korea and together with the rest of the world. There are many obstacles, there are possibilities, uh, there are interrogatives, and uh, we hope that this all will come to good answers. Uh, we have also become aware, more aware of uh, what can be done to advance the uh, values that UPF upholds, such as the interdependence, common prosperity, centered on universally shared values. We hope that that can be developed in the area. Uh, I would like, if you would, to make a final statement, no more than one minute, if you would like to summarize an idea or a thought, and uh, to conclude your participation as a speaker in the session. Any of you can start. Okay, I will uh, take the lead uh, if possible. Yes. Uh, very shortly, as uh, I mentioned, uh, I think dealing with the DPRK is dealing with the uh, Kim dynasty. At that point in time, there is no uh, successor to Mr. Kim Jong-un. Therefore, if he falls, the, the, the current regime falls. And the, the challenge is to make him believe that he can change the openness of the DPRK without changing uh, his fate. And unfortunately, for the moment, I do not see a way uh, of doing it. Okay, thank you, Mr. Reshev. Um... Uh, I think that North Korea is a very peculiar country and uh, they have some, uh, sometimes they want to uh, astonish the outside world with some, maybe the biggest uh, hotel in the world or some other, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, yeah, uh, and I hope that in the future they will astonish the world with the rapid development of the economy. Thank you, Dr. Re uh, Leshakov and well, Mr. Frizakar. I'd like to come back to Mr. Uh, President Kim De Chung, the Nobel Prize carrier. He, he uh, created the sunshine policy. Many people said that this is very naive, but it's, uh, maybe it's better to work with certain kind of positive emotions to the enemy. Uh, and I know that there is, North Korea has the, also the interest some interest to also regarding Kaesong. And I wish uh, a patient negotiation by Seoul, Washington and, and other firms, those who would like to reopen and operate again in Kaesong. Also some, uh, I think so, the idea of, of Kim De Chong to have more sunshine also from South and from the international policy would be good. And also from Kim De Chong, he had a certain kind of thoughts in mind. And uh, there is a fable of the Greek poet Aesop. He lived in the sixth century before Christ. And he had a fable with the title, The North Wind and the Sun. And Kim De Chong said, we make sunshine policy. Well, it was not successful, but maybe in the future. And Nobel Prize carrier Kim De Chung, 
argued that sunshine is more effective than strong wind in making North Korea come out of isolation and confrontation. This I would like to say. Thank you, Mr. Frizakar, for your, for your thought. Uh, certainly, sometimes we need to change the hearts of the people. And in this case, we need to change the heart of Kim Jong-un uh, and those who are just behind him. Uh, I would like to also express that this has been a very enriching webinar. Uh, thanks to our dear panelists who have experienced, studied, and know so much about what's happening in the, on the peninsula. Thank you very much for sharing with us. And uh, may you have a good day and uh, a good week and a good forever. <laughs> So uh, before we completely close, I would like to announce uh, a next, our next session, which will be at 4 p.m. today. And there you go, it's on the screen uh, for you to have a look. Uh, it's on uh, competing worldviews concerning Korean reunification how much will they be a factor in the outcome with a very good group of speakers and very enlightening. So thank you everyone. Thank you to all the, the staff involved and everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank, thank you very, very much. much. Thank you. Thank so, you very bye much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Yeah.